as you know, we are beginning a new uh, Bible study, if you want to call it that. Um, it's really a program, a, a new way of, a, a new curriculum. And uh, we will be going through the Bible. Uh, I will not promise that we will go all the way through the Bible, although that's what the intention is. Uh, but it would take a long time to do that. And, and if we make it all the way through, great, but we're going to get started anyway. Uh, ELBA uh, is, uh, stands for Engaged Learning of the Bible with Application. Uh, so the Bible is what is the subject under discussion. We want to learn it and learn what it says, learn its contents, and we want to do so by engaging. Uh, and so this is not going to be somebody just standing up here and teaching for an hour or even a half hour, uh, but rather there will be some elements here we, where we are getting you engaged so that you can learn better. And so then finally, the application. Uh, it's one thing for us to know what the Bible says. It's another thing for us to really understand how it applies to our lives. Why is, it, why is passage such and such relevant for us today? And so that, that's the goal here of Elba is to get you learning the Bible uh, in a way that engages you and then that we would have a, an application uh, for relevance for your life uh, at the end of all that. Okay. What drives Elba? Uh, Elba is going to drive a Tesla. What is the structure of our, uh, of our hour? Okay, hour and 15 minutes. I, I'm imagining this to go um, between 8 and 8.30. 8.15 is what I'm shooting for. So an hour and 15 minutes each, each week, including the devotional piece. Uh, is really what I'm shooting for. And I'm just saying that so that when 8 o'clock comes, uh, you're, you're thinking in terms of 8.15 is more likely. Uh, but uh, Tesla, T-E-S-L-A, T for topic, E for exercise, S-L for second look, and then A for application. So uh, think each week in terms of we will have a topic under discussion. We will have a chapter or multiple chapters out of the Bible. We'll talk about what's in those chapters. And so that's the content of, of what we're looking at. Then we'll have an exercise uh, where hopefully you're doing something that reinforces that concept. Um, I, I don't know how long ago and who's, who kind of put this into my uh, philosophy of education, but uh, a big part of my philosophy of edu education is the students should be doing something. And so uh, after I will teach for 10, 15, 20 minutes maybe each week on whatever the topic is, it may be more, maybe less, whatever, but after that we'll have an exercise that will reinforce that. Then we'll look at that topic again from another angle. So we'll take a second look. Uh, oftentimes, this piece of the equation will be connecting whatever the Old Testament passage is to the New Testament. And so how does this tie in with the rest of the Bible uh, will often be what that second look will uh, have to say. And then finally, the application. Uh, we, will, we will make application of each week's passage to your life and what is the relevance for me for today. And uh, so that's going to be an important part. The E and the A, the exercise and the application portions, will sometimes and, and oftentimes uh, have a small group element to them. Another piece of this ELBA curriculum is the small group idea. Uh, I was thinking about this on the way over tonight. It really, if you boil it down and you say, what is this ELBA thing? It's really, I view it as a, uh, a hybrid of Sunday school plus life group community. So uh, what our exercise might be a small group discussion. Our application might be a small group discussion. But in addition to those uh, discussions about the c concepts that we're talking about, I actually want to have some small group discussion that has nothing to do with the topic. So in other words, we're really just doing the small group thing. 
And so we will have uh, groups uh, where you will get together and get to know each other better. I'll, I'll ask some questions uh, that are designed to get you uh, getting to know one another better, that we're growing in community and unity and those kinds of things, which is really almost a separate piece, uh, but we're going to work it in. And so as opposed, we don't have small groups, life groups here, uh, at least we don't right now. Um, this is going to become that for, for us, at least for this time, uh, where as opposed to going to someone's house and sitting and looking at a passage of scripture and talking about it and so forth, we're doing that here, and then, but we're just doing it all in the same room uh, in groups, okay? All right. In addition to the Tesla uh, structure, uh, at the beginning and end of each uh, day, uh, of each lesson, we will have questions for investigation and then questions for reflection. And so I'll get more into that in just a second. Um, okay, uh, we, we've kind of built this as an in-depth study. Yes and no, uh, it, it's, it'll be in-depth for some. It'll feel a little bit less deep for others. But I am trying to make this to be something that uh, children all the way up to uh, very um, um, well-versed saints uh, that know their Bible pretty well will hopefully still get something out of this, but the children can also uh, understand uh, what we're doing. And so I'm, I'm trying to have it in that uh, uh, sweet spot. Um, okay. Another thing is, because we're not going in-depth like a class at Liberty, um, or even more in-depth, um, I can't say everything. First of all, I don't know everything. But secondly, I can't say everything. So we're not going to get to every little minute detail about every text. What a teacher does is to bring out those things that he or she feels is most important or wants to get across that day. In other words, good teaching comes from a perspective. Uh, this is kind of a soapbox for me in terms of university. Um, we go to university to hear a point of view. In other words, to hear perspective. Um, otherwise, we can just stay at home and have Google. If all you want is facts, stay at home and have Google. But we come to uh, learn and be educated from a point of view. And then you don't all have to agree with that point of view, but you can uh, think through how you, your point of view uh, intersects with that point of view. And so anyway, what I'm trying to get across there is I won't be teaching every little minute, minute detail, but I'll be bringing out those things that seem right to bring out. At some point down the road, after everyone is very familiar and comfortable with the structure, because we're going to have this structure over and over and over, um, then we can. Uh, I may pass the torch and, and we may have some other people do the actual teaching element um, later on. But we'll, we'll get it established first. Um, so that everybody is, is kind of on board with what we're doing here. All right? So, I mentioned the questions for investigation and questions for reflection. Each week we'll have questions that I will ask on the screen and you will answer. And so in order to do that, in order to make that happen, we're using this presentation software called Menti, M-E-N-T-I, and uh, we've actually done this before. Pastor Jeff used this um, at least once in a previous session. And so just to refresh your memory on this, I want to show you uh, some instructions here for you to be able to vote, to answer these questions. Now, if you're not technologically advanced, um, we have some tablets up here that are pre-programmed and ready to go. We also have some coaches that will help you to, on your tablets. But So you have two options here. You can simply take your phone and go to, actually I have more than two options, but you can take your phone and go to menti.com, M-E-N-T-I.com. Or you can take your camera and scan that QR code and it will take you to menti.com. Uh, and then when you get there, you can punch in this code, eight-digit code there, 
and then you'll be ready to answer some questions, and then we'll, we'll try that. Now, again, you, we have some tablets ready to go up here. If you'd like to have a tablet and keep that separate, it's first of all, it's bigger for those who um, would rather see something a little bigger, but they're right here. Anybody like a tablet that is pre-programmed, ready to go to vote, to do your voting? Okay, right here. It doesn't? That's probably because the QR code probably took you straight there. This one you'll probably have to put in a code. So anybody else want a tablet, they're going to pass them around, and they'll coach you on how to get on there. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, the, yeah, the Wi-Fi, yeah. Yeah, hold that thought for just a second. Yeah, I think I think you're right about that. I think you I think you're going to have to use uh, LTE or 5G or whatever. So, Pastor Jeff, they're saying that the, for phones the Wi-Fi is not connecting, so they need to use LTE, 5G, whatever. Yeah, yeah. Otherwise, you can use a tablet. There's several more tablets up here. If you anybody wants to use one, they're right here on the front rows. Yeah. Yeah, I went ahead and advanced it to the first question. I'll, uh, I can put this back up in a second as well. Let's see. Okay. Now, as you're as you're voting. Um, you can see here on the screen that the results are hidden, okay? Um, you can see that we have several people who have voted already. Um, and I'm going to wait to show, so I will be able to show the results here in a little bit. Um, yeah, feel free to go ahead and vote on this question. The question is, who was the 30th president of the United States? The answer, possible answers are Woodrow Wilson, Calvin Coolidge, uh, Herbert Hoover, and Ronald Reagan. Now, I specifically wanted to ask a question that I figured that not everybody would know the answer, and the reason I wanted to do that was so that we could see how the percentages, you can see who is voting for what, okay? And I'm, I'm not going to let that sway your vote. Right now we are because it's a test, but... Um, you, you can see that, that, that how, that's how many people have voted for each thing, right? Okay, so I want you to get the idea of what we're after here. This is a corporate thing. In other words, nobody is going to know what you answered. I am not here to embarrass you. That's not what this is about, right? This is about as a church, as a group of people right here, how many people know X, Y, or Z? And so as I th throw out these questions before we talk about the subject, that is questions for investigation. And then after we actually talk about it, we'll go back and look at those questions again, and we will have questions for reflection, and then we'll be able to see, have we... Are we getting better results? And again, it's not in, on the individual level. Okay? Nobody knows what you've answered, so there's no reason to have any kind of embarrassment if you don't know anything. But here's the thing. If we had, let's say we had 40% of the church get right answers on these questions before we start. Okay? 
great, that's a baseline. Then we do our elbow thing, and then at the end, we have 80% of the church get right answers. What will we be able to say then? We have measurable data that we as a church have learned something, right? And that's what we're after is can we have measurable data that says, yes, we're actually learning something, okay, as a church. Not, not that I'm not interested in the individual, but we're interested in are we as a church uh, getting uh, learning these things. All right, so here's another question. This one is designed uh, to have 100% right answers, unless you guys want to uh, be silly. But here I'm showing the results. I'm going to hide the results. You can see now the results are hidden. Maybe somebody has voted for something else. We don't know. Um, I can also show the correct answer, which I will do now. By the way, the correct answer for the previous question was Calvin Coolidge. So the majority got it. Okay. Um, by the way, those four presidents, and if you don't learn anything about the Bible today, at least you'll learn this. Those are the only four presidents uh, whose first and last names start with the same letter. Okay. All right. Okay. But Calvin Coolidge was 30. Okay. So we spell blue, B-L-U. Uh, so one person spells it this other way. You see, three percent right there. Okay, now at this point, are, is there anybody that's left out? You, you, anybody that hasn't been able to get on? And yeah, no, okay, okay, okay. So we're all on board here because we're about to do it for real now. Okay, we're about to get the real questions. All right, Father, thank you for these people, and thank you for Elba. Thank you for your word. Thank you that we are embarking on something here. I ask that you would bless it, that we would learn more about your word and, um, and retain even some things. Um, bring us together in community in the process. Let this thing do what it's intended to do. And I ask that you would do what you intend to do through us for this. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. So here we go. Officially, welcome to Elba. All right. Questions for investigation. Our first unit, which will take the next seven weeks, is Genesis 1 through 11. Genesis 1 through 11. So we're going to go through, because this is the beginning of an entire unit, I'm going to have 10 questions here that cover Genesis 1 through 11. Uh, we will not do the backside of this, the reflection questions, until after we finish the seven-week unit. Okay, here we go. Number one. We're for real now. Genesis 1 uses the specific word create to describe how God brought what into being. Again, I have the results hidden, and so um, I'm going to give a chance for everybody to answer. The word create is the key word. Genesis 1 uses the word create to describe how God brought what into being. Heavens and earth, sun, moon, and stars, animals, and humans. Part B Answer B, heavens and earth, plant and animal life, and humans. Answer C, heavens and earth, angelic hosts, cosmic bodies, plants, animals, and humans. And answer D, heavens and earth, animals, and humans. All right. Anybody need, well, it looks like we have a few, we had 35 answering earlier, so I'll give it just a second here. Okay. Oh, 36. Anybody need more time? Okay. Here are the results. Oh, 37. We're sorry, Doc. Okay. Okay. We're sorry, Doctor. Nothing, nothing to be. Now, this is not, this is not the correct answer. This is just what you guys voted. Okay, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not showing the correct answer yet. Okay. All right, next question. Eden was in close proximity to what rivers? Is it A, 
Is it the Missouri and Mississippi? <laughs> the Indus and the Ganges? Tigris and Euphrates? Or Nile and Pishon? Okay, we got 39 there. Okay, let's view the results on that. Pretty overwhelmingly, we think it's Tigris and Euphrates. Okay, so again, I'm not going to show the correct answer yet, but um, that was pretty, a pretty high, high majority there. Okay, in the first 11 chapters of Genesis, the first verse most strongly prophetic concerning the coming of the Christ is... Genesis 2.15, Genesis 3.15, Genesis 4.15, and Genesis 9.15. No, you can just guess. You can just guess. Yeah, just guess. Um, which, I mean, that's part of the game is, you know, um, at the end of this, I think there's going to be less guessing and more, more we got it. Well, more. At no point do I expect 100%. Okay. All right. We've got 38 people. Let's see what we got here. A slim majority say 315. Okay. Let's keep going. Who does the Bible record as the first musician? Is it Adam? Jubal? Mahalel? Or Enoch. All right, 38. We got a, one person that's hanging on for dear life. Okay, uh, show results. We got uh, uh, Jubal has the, the, the uh, majority there for sure. All right, keep going. How many cows were on the ark? One, two, three, or seven. Guys, this is a little bit of a thinking cap problem. How many cows were on the ark? I will answer all of these over the next six weeks. All right. Here we go. 36, 37. All right. Most people are saying two, a few ones, quite a few sevens. Okay. All right. And seven is rising for some reason. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Here we go. From which of Noah's sons did Abraham descend? Okay. Shem, Ham, Japheth, and Canaan, from which of Noah's sons did Abraham descend? All right, here we go. The results, Ooh, we got us a nice little stair step here. Uh, and on this one, I'm going to go ahead and reveal the correct answer for this one, just so you can see how that works. So Shem was the correct answer, and the majority of people got it, so that was Shem. Okay. All right. In which of the first 11 chapters of Genesis is animal sacrifice referenced? 
And I'm going to make a point about this when we talk about it. There, there's, a, there's a reason I'm bringing this up. Uh, but what chapters reference animal sacrifice? Is it 1, 2, 3, 4, and 10? 3, 4, and 8? 4, and 5? Or it's not in there at all? That's a thinking cap question for sure. All right, so looks like we are mostly in the three, four, and eight with some others mixed in. Pretty, pretty good mix there. All right. True or false, God commanded Adam to name the animals. True or false, God commanded Adam to name the animals. Okay, we've got a majority true on this one. But it's false. The key word is what? Commanded. He didn't command him to name the animals. He brought the animals to him to see what he would name them. And we're going to make a point about that. There's actually, uh, again, these things, there's, there's a reason I'm bringing these things up. It's not quite just totally random here. There's a real point to be made there. Okay. True or false, God formed woman from Adam's rib and named her Eve. Close on that one, okay. And finally, I think this is the last question. How was Lot related to Abram? Right at the tail end of chapter 11, we learn how Lot was related to Abram. Was he his son, his in-law, his nephew, or a friend? He was nephew. That was the correct answer. Large majority there. All right. So there you go. There's our questions for investigation. Hopefully you made a mental note of that so you can be listening out for that when we talk about these things over the next several weeks. All right. Now we actually begin. All right. In the topic segment, the topic for today is actually an overview of the Bible. So we're going to get into Genesis 1 next week. But today, I'm just going to briefly do some overview of the Bible. And again, there's so much we can say about the Bible, uh, but, um, and obviously I won't say all that there is that we can say about the Bible. Very little, actually. But uh, we do want to uh, answer some questions here about the Bible. What is the Bible? The Bible is 66 books uh, written by more than 35 authors spanning about 1,500 years from the first book written to the last book written. Uh, Moses in the 1400s B.C. Um, is traditionally uh, the authorship of the first five books is ascribed to uh, Moses uh, in the 1400s B.C. Uh, all the way down to John at the tail end of the first century A.D. So about 1,500 years of time passing uh, with all these 66 books being written. We believe that the Bible was inspired by God, but written down by human beings. We also believe the Bible is inerrant and in all of these things, and that goes back to uh, some of our doctrinal statements that we went through over the last year. Okay, why do we have the Bible? What is the purpose of the Bible? And I, I wrote this, to show us who God is, who we are, what God has done for us, and how we are to respond to Him 
and how we are to live. Let me say that again. To show us who God is, who we are, what God has done for us, how we are to respond to him, and how we are to live. Now, then I went to the Westminster Shorter Catechism. This is a doctrinal statement in a kind of a question and answer form from the 1600s uh, that we've, we've gone back and referenced for, for the 400 years since um, to see what did that say about why do we have the Bible. Here's what their question is. What did the scriptures principally teach? And the answer is, the scriptures principally teach what man is to believe concerning God and what duty God requires of man. And so what I had said there lines up pretty well with that. Again, I said, why do we have the Bible to show us who God is, who we are, what God has done for us, how we are to respond to him and how we are to live? The Westminster Shorter Catechism says, what do the scriptures principally teach? The scriptures principally teach what man is to believe concerning God and what duty God requires of man. Okay, what does the Bible not tell us? The Bible does not tell us whether to buy watermelons or cantaloupes when we go to the grocery store. The Bible does not tell us what gas station has the cheapest gas in town. The Bible does not tell us what the square root of 81 is. The Bible does not tell us that gravity exists. Okay, in other words, the Bible does not have the answer to every question. And it is good and right and proper for us to seek some answers, many answers, outside the Bible, because the Bible does not answer every question. The Bible answers those questions that we need to know the answer to about the fall and redemption of man, how to be saved, how to be right with God, and how to live in general. It does not tell you whether you should be a missionary to China or whether you should be an HVAC repairman in Lynchburg. In other words, we still have to hear the voice of God apart from and in conjunction with the Bible. Uh, The Bible, again, tells us everything we need to know about how to be right with God. It does not tell us every little single detail of life. We have other sources of information for that. All right, how do we know the Bible is true? Several evidences, uh, including archaeological evidence. Uh, There is nothing in the archaeological evidence that directly contradicts Scripture, and they're finding more and more archaeological evidence all the time, and every time they do, it's either neutral or it confirms or backs up or supports the things that Scripture say. Um, I think in terms of the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, that was probably arguably the the largest archaeological find maybe ever. Before they found that, uh, people had real questions about uh, some legitimacy of some things biblical in terms of dating of when these things were written. For example, the book of Isaiah. And uh, when we found the Dead Sea Scrolls, all of a sudden it was like, "Eh, no, the Bible seems to be more uh, legitimate uh, than these people had given it credit. So every time we have an archaeological find, it's either neutral or it backs up what Scripture says about itself. Um, Self-consistency. Again, the question is, how do we know the Bible is true? Self-consistency. A lot of people will say that uh, the Bible is full of holes and and, uh, uh, that it contradicts itself. Um, There are some places in the Bible where that seems to be the case, um, alleged contradictions. But in every place, we can find a way to understand how that's not true. Uh, the Bible does not contradict itself in that way. Uh, and so it's very, con- again, 66 books over 1,500 years. It is very consistent with itself. Prophetic evidence. Uh, the Bible makes many prophetic claims, um, particularly about Jesus, but many other things as well, some of which have come to pass. Um, and some which will come to pass in the future. Uh, But particularly the prophetic words about Jesus coming and then him fulfilling all those things, the odds of that are astronomical. And uh, so the prophetic evidence is very strong for us to 
uh, believe that the Bible is true. And then Jesus himself. The evidence for Jesus and the evidence for the Gospels being legitimate is overwhelming. Um, you, you would have to have the faith of many, many mustard seeds uh, to believe that Jesus wasn't who he said he was or that the Gospels aren't what they say they are. Um, you would have to have more faith. It takes more faith to disbelieve um, Jesus than it does to believe based on the evidence alone uh, uh, of, the, as I say, the Gospels and Acts um, that the, the, the things that they claim are true. And so if the things they claim are true, in other words, if Jesus really is the Son of God, fully divine, and he's, he's the one, and he says everything in the Old Testament is true, he, he affirms the authority of the Old Testament. Well, that's pretty strong then that we can believe the whole Bible. All right. How does the Bible differ, next question, from other holy books, so-called? Well, this question is basically the same as asking the question, how is Christianity unique or how is Christianity different from every other religion? And we could say a lot about that, but the main thing I would say there is Every other religion and every other so-called holy book, every other system, claims that man is basically good. Uh, if you hear the world talk, the world will say, well, people are basically good, and you have a few bad apples that spoil the bunch. If you ask the average person on the sidewalk, hey, are you a good person? They will say, yeah, I'm a good person. Well, more, more good than bad. Well, that's the world's view, is that uh, we are basically good, and we got a little bit of bad, or we might have a few bad people here and there. That is the opposite of the Christian view, and it's the opposite of what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that we are all fundamentally, fundamentally bad. We are all fundamentally bad since Adam, and we'll get to that right in Genesis chapter 3 uh, in a mere three weeks. Uh, but we are all fundamentally bad, and God has interjected himself into the equation to save us, to make us, uh, to take us from someone that's fundamentally bad to someone who uh, exudes his goodness and righteousness. God provides the solution to man's problem of unrighteousness by coming to earth himself in the form of a man and dying in our place. Every other religion prescribes good deeds and self-betterment as the path to eternal life or nirvana or whatever ideal state we're looking for. The Bible alone, Christianity alone, says there's no way we can achieve eternal life by what we do, and it's only by receiving the free gift of God, the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, that we can obtain eternal life. Okay, what are the four acts of the Bible's plot? The four acts of the Bible's plot are creation, fall, redemption, and restoration. Creation, fall, redemption, and restoration. And really, we get the first two right in the first three chapters of Genesis. Creation and fall. And then the rest of the Bible is, is this story of redemption and restoration. Last question uh, for this, and then we'll move on to our exercise. What's the primary message of the Bible? The primary message of the Bible is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I wanted to kind of throw this out. We'll call this a little pre-exercise. Um, if I said to you, give me a verse that encapsulates the gospel. What is the gospel? And I'm sure we'd have many right answers. Why don't you try that? Why don't you throw out what verse? Yeah, go ahead, Jessica. Yes, well, that's true, and there are elements of the gospel in there. But what, what verse would be a verse where you say, that's the gospel? John 3.16, I figured I would hear that, okay? All right, God so loved the world, he gave, all we need to do is believe, okay? What's the gospel? What other verse might you have that, yeah? Great Commission, okay, the Great Commission, go out into all the world, preach the gospel, make, make disciples. John 1.1, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was God, the Word was with God. Okay? What's the gospel? Let me have one more, maybe. Uh, 
Okay, go ahead. Well, okay, that, that certainly is a, a big command for us. Uh, love the Lord your God with all, the, all your heart. The great, the great commandment, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. <clears throat> um, okay, what is the gospel? The gospel is 1 Corinthians 15.3, which says, Christ died for our sins. According to the scriptures, he was buried and he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. That's the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let me say it again. Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. He was buried and he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. Anybody have, uh, because I don't have a, um, actually I do have it right here. Uh, Anybody want to read the beginning of 1 Corinthians 15? The first two verses. Stop. The what? Paul says he's declaring to the Corinthians the what? Keep going. And what is that gospel? No, the, read, read the next verse. And he was buried for three days, and then he rose again. That's the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, let's unpack that just a little bit, and then we'll turn to our uh, um, exercise. Adam and Eve sinned, Genesis 3. Everyone who's been born since, with the exception of Jesus, everyone who's been born since inherits that sin nature from Adam. Romans 5, 12, and 18. Because of this sin nature and because of the fact that we have committed sins, we are deserving of death, Romans 6, 23. The wrath of God is stored up for us, Romans 1, 18. But God made a way for us to be converted from unrighteous to righteous by sending his own son. God's son is God himself. The son is not the father, but both the son and the father, as well as the Holy Spirit, are fully God. God came to earth in the form of a human being, Philippians 2. He was born sinless and perfect and lived a sinless life, and he was tortured and killed as a substitutionary sacrifice. Sin requires death, and Jesus died to pay the penalty for sin. Now we don't have to pay that penalty. That's the substitution. This free gift of salvation is applied by believing in him, John 3.16. This means trusting in God through Jesus to do what he said he would do to give us a not guilty verdict and present us faultless before him on the last day. But Jesus not only died, therefore securing our not guilty verdict, he also rose again and is alive today. Because of his resurrected life, we also have newness of life. God empowers us by his spirit to walk in a new, holy way of living, Romans 6.14. That is the gospel of Jesus Christ unpacked a little bit. And this is the primary message of the Bible. Everything else points to this, and everything else supports this. It gives you the backdrop to this idea of the gospel of Jesus Christ. All right. 